second Sunday in the month of March. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and the Sunday just before St. Patrick's Day, therefore, I do. Anyway, welcome. We are glad to have you join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior this morning. And another thanks. Thanks for sending your clocks forward last night. <laughs> it is daylight savings time, the time that we enjoy having a little more daylight into the evening. So. We do have a few announcements. The session of our church will be meeting this Tuesday evening via Zoom. The meeting will be at 7 o'clock and the link has been sent out to the session members. Our Bible study meets every Thursday at 10 a.m. also via Zoom. It's a wonderful time of conversation, Bible study, and we always close with a time of prayer. I thank Sue for being our lay leader, stepping up and doing that again. And uh, also, all the others that helped to make the service um, a reality, as well as thank you for making this church an absolutely wonderful place to be a part of. So with that, let us worship God. We'll turn it over to Sue as we'll have this morning's introductory points. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The nicest thing about being a lay leader is not wearing glasses. <laughs> I can actually see because the glasses don't fog up. <laughs> Let's all rise for the call to worship. Give thanks to God. Proclaim his goodness throughout all the world. Let all of us gathered here celebrate God's absolute love. Let us offer our lives in service to others. Thanks be to God for the blessings which have been poured on us. May the Lord enable us to use our gifts to serve him in our world. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather here on this day of sharing, Remind us that you have shared with us your most precious gift, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to model our lives after his messages of compassion and service to you and to all your world. In Christ's name we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to join in humming our hymn of praise, the heart of worship when the music fades.
some will join in singing or humming, uh, Jesus loves me. Just the first verse uh, for the time with children.
Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for all that you have given to us, especially your Son. In thankfulness, Lord, we offer our tithes, our offerings to you to further your kingdom, to do what you've called us to do here at our church and all that we do throughout your world. Bless these offerings. May they just fully be used and only for what you have for them and what you and that we dedicate them to you. Just we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to this time of prayer, there's so many things that we could pray about that uh, it's just uh, unlimited, obviously. We pray for our families, our loved ones, our church. We pray for the session meeting on Tuesday, for the elders to do God's will here at our church. We pray that uh, God will put an end to this pandemic and uh, make things normal again as well. So let us go to God in prayer. Dear God, we thank you that we can come together as your people in this time of prayer. There's so many things we pray for and there are so many things in our hearts. But thinking about our church, we, we pray for the session meeting on Tuesday evening that the elders will do your will and yours only in all decisions that need to be made. We pray, Lord, for our congregation, for their safety in all ways, not, in, not just the, the coronavirus, but other health concerns that people have. We pray for their healing, whether it be spiritual, physical, emotional, relational, all the things that affect our lives in different ways. We pray for your guidance and especially how we can spread the good news, maybe by a phone call, maybe by talking to a neighbor outside. But however you put people into our paths, and we can sh tell them and show them how important and how wonderful a relationship with you truly is. We pray, Lord, for different parts of our church, the food bank, the deacons, the elders, and may they all do, again, what you call them to do. We pray, Lord, for the church worldwide. There's persecution in many places and in different ways. Whether it be some of the persecution that occurs in our own country, but also in other places such as India and China and Nigeria and others. Be with those that are persecuted and give them strength. Lord, in this time and at all times, we, we pray for a revival, a revival of sending your Holy Spirit and a newness of life to so many people. We continue in our prayers for our country, our state and community, for all those in every level of our government, legislators and other elected officials. We pray that they will really look to the motto in God we trust in making all decisions, not thinking about what they want for themselves or what they think is the best in different ways, but only what you want. We pray that the leaders will just strive and have a desire to submit to your rule, because then and only then will your people be served. Lord, we pray for those in our world that are suffering for lack of food, clothing, and shelter. We pray, Lord, for those that are the little babies that are suffering, suffer from abortions. We pray for those that are oppressed because of different reasons. We pray, Lord, that your love will be poured out on the world, this world that you created, this world that you love. God, there's so many times that we sin against you and others. We 
have this time that we can lift up the prayer's confession to you. We're not worthy to be heard. But you and your abundant love and care for us, listen to every word and thought that we have. So hear us, Lord, now as we lift up our prayers of confession to you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, for sending your Son to the cross for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you, Lord, that you pardon us, that you do forgive us. Bring us into a right relationship with you. And Lord, as we continue in our prayers, we ask you to hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Adrian now will present this morning's anthem. It's called Beautiful. Let us really focus on God as Adrian plays this beautiful piece.
That was just beautiful. Thank you. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 86, verses 1 through 7. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble I call on you, for you will answer me. Thank you, Sue. Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of John. This passage that I'll be reading is part of a conversation that Jesus had with a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was one of the leaders of the Jews, and he came to Jesus at night. Because he didn't want to probably be seen by others. Later on, we read that Nicodemus was really a disciple, became a disciple, a follower of Jesus. He assisted Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea in Jesus' burial as well. So let us hear words spoken by our Lord and Savior Jesus from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Those who believe in Him are not condemned, but those who do not believe in Him are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what uh, is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the words of our Lord endure forever. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, where we see the gospel in miniature. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts. If there's anything between us and you, we ask you, Lord, to take it so we can fully focus on you and on you alone. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Many years ago, there was a mother that sat down at the breakfast table with her eight-year-old son, Bradley. Under her plate, she saw a note written by her son. It read, Mother owes Bradley for writing errands, 25 cents. For being good, 10 cents. For taking music lessons, 15 cents. For extras, 5 cents. Total, 55 cents. The mother smiled, but 
made no comment. At lunch, Bradley found the bill that he had written under his plate with 55 cents. And there was another piece of paper folded exactly the same way he had folded his. Opening it, he read, Bradley owes mother for nursing him through the flu. Nothing. For being good to him. Nothing. For clothes, shoes, and playthings. Nothing. For his meals. Nothing. Total. Nothing. Isn't that a great illustration of God's love? Nothing. God gave his all for us, but actually much more so than Bradley's mother. His love for us, described by Jesus in John 3.16, may seem actually pretty simple. Yet, on the other hand, it's pretty complicated because it has so many facets, so many points to think about. John 3.16 is undoubtedly the most famous verse in the entire Bible. Martin Luther called it the gospel in miniature. It has also been called the heart of the gospel, the international treasure, and other titles. Athletes have worn this verse on their faces, and fans have made signs showing John 3.16. It has been placed on billboards for many people to see, so they will be reminded of this message. And again, it is the most widely quoted verse in the world. Dale Bruner, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, broke down this verse into small sections. In each of these parts, there are profound truths. It starts out with, for God. Bruner stated this is the greatest subject ever. The first starts with the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, the all-powerful, all-knowing God that is everywhere. He is the creator, sustainer, and absolutely loves what he made, including each one of you. The most famous verse in the Bible starts with God, for God is the focus of the entire book. Literally thousands of books have been written on theology, the study of God. People have studied it and discussed God's attributes for thousands of years. He is the greatest subject ever. That's the beginning of the gospel in miniature. Right after mentioning the greatest subject ever, Jesus said a very short word in the English language. It is... So, in this little two-letter word, we see that God did something to the greatest extent ever. This is such a little word in English, again, just two letters long. But it has such a powerful meaning in the Greek. The Greek word means, in this manner, thus, or so. It was in this manner that God could do something very, very profound. Something to the greatest extent ever. It is to the greatest extent of God's feelings toward you that he would choose to do the rest of this verse. Then we get to another one word section. This word is loved. Love is the greatest affection ever. We can love all kinds of things. There are four words in the ancient Greek that we translate as love. But in this verse, we have the word agapao. Agape is how we say it in English. Agape is the love that God has for us and used to describe the love that Christians are to have for one another and for everyone. The Greek word agapao seems to have been virtually a Christian invention, a new word for a new thing. It was rarely seen in secular writings of the New Testament times. 
It was almost non-existent before the New Testament. Agapao draws its meaning directly from the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. It is not a form of natural affection, but a supernatural fruit of the Spirit, as Paul wrote about in his letter to the Galatians. It is a matter of will rather than feeling. For Christians are told they must love even those they dislike, as we see in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus went on to say, So, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you to doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Agape, love, is a basic element in being like Christ. We have the word agape repeatedly in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, where, it is to, where Paul describes what love is. I preached on this four weeks ago on Valentine's Day. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. In each of these instances, love is a verb, an action that we are to take in relation to other people. Regarding God's love, Richard Halverson said, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There is nothing you can do to make God love you less. His love is unconditional, impartial, everlasting, infinite, perfect. To love, there has to be someone or something that is loved. John 3.16 tells that it is the world. The world is the greatest object ever. The world, as it is translated in most versions of the Bible, is cosmos in the Greek. God loves the entirety of what he has created, especially human beings, his special creation. He loves all of us. We read in 2 Peter that it is God's will that none should perish, where he wrote, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. We are part of a world that is loved by God. Then we get to the most wonderful event in all of history. God loved the world in such a manner that he gave his only son. This is the greatest gift ever. The verb gave is in the past tense. It was something that was completed once and for all, never needed to be repeated again. It was a definitive historical act and deed. God the Father did not just emotionally love the world and do nothing about it. No, he gave. He gave so deeply and so personally that he sent his only son. We cannot fathom the extent of this absolutely unique divine event. But it happened in history, and it is the world's most profound event ever. When one stops to think of it as a real event, one can only bow one's head in wonder. 
God gave his only son. But who did God give this gift? It was given so that everyone, this is the greatest opportunity ever. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is something that God did for everyone. There are various theological viewpoints regarding this, but the point is that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was all that was necessary for the salvation of everyone. I believe God must work in someone's heart before they have a belief in Christ Jesus. There is nothing a person can do on their own without God's help to come to a saving faith. But this is the greatest opportunity ever given. So what happens inside a person regarding this gift? Jesus said, who believes in him? For the person involved, this is the greatest commitment ever. Notice Jesus said, believes in him. He didn't say believes about him. There's a great difference. It's easy to believe about something or someone. We can simply believe that Jesus lived on the earth as believing about him. Skeptics generally will acknowledge that Jesus lived on the earth. Those of the Jewish faith acknowledge Jesus was a good teacher. And those of the Islamic religion acknowledge him as just a prophet. One can believe that he performed miracles and used parables to tell people about God. That also is believing about him. But believing in him is something entirely different. It is at a much deeper level. Believing in Jesus means we are trusting in and entrusting ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ. It is believing that He, and only He, is the one that died for our sins on the cross on Good Friday and rose for us on Easter morning. It is believing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That brings us to the next part of this incredible verse. The benefit of believing in Him. The benefit is that we may not perish, which is the greatest rescue ever. We read about rescues in a variety of means and situations. Some of us may have adopted a rescue animal. Linda and I adopted our rescue dog, Martha, almost 14 years ago. People are rescued when they are adrift at sea, under destroyed buildings after an earthquake, from flooded out houses due to a hurricane, or from smashed up cars after an accident. These people are in danger of perishing, physically dying from their unfortunate situations. But these are all human rescues. But when we believe in Jesus, we will never perish. Oh yes, we will eventually die physically. But we are rescued in a supernatural, spiritual way. The Holy Spirit lives within us and changes us. We are no longer in danger of spiritually perishing, being condemned to being without God forever. Our life goes on yet in a different form. We are told we will receive a new body. We don't know what that will be, and to me it really doesn't matter. You won't perish when you believe in Jesus Christ because of God's love for you. The verse concludes with, but may have eternal life. It is the greatest promise ever. Just knowing that I will never perish, will live eternally with my Lord and Savior because of what he has done for me, is definitely exciting for me. I don't need anything else. Eternity is something hard for people to understand, yet it is 
of promise of God. The word Jesus said is defined as without beginning and end. That which always has been and always will be. Never to cease. Everlasting. Think about something being everlasting. Something going on forever and ever and ever and ever. It is beyond our human understanding since we are finite beings. We are only aware of our earthly finite experience. Receiving the promise of eternal life is the ultimate result of the fact that God loves you. The ultimate result of the gospel in miniature. The 16th verse in the third chapter of John's gospel is the heart of the gospel. From the heart of God who loved us so much to the heart of every individual that needs him so much. So listen to this verse in its entirety. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Throughout this verse, we see that we are loved. Loved by God who created us and loved through his giving of his son. We are loved by Jesus Christ by his submitting himself to his Father's will and going to the cross for our sins and being raised from the dead on that glorious Sunday morning. My friends, you are loved. Not because of anything you did to deserve it, but because of what God did in the gospel and miniature. May we all learn to love others the way God loves us, unconditionally. It's the perfect way to live. We can do so when we fully focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in all aspects of our lives. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel in miniature. Help us, Lord, to really understand what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask you to stand as you are able and on our final hum. To God be the glory.
touch your heart this morning and would like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The only Son of God. God loves you so much that he sent his Son. Talk to me afterwards or call me later. Those that are watching on YouTube, feel free to call at any time. I would love to have that conversation with you. And now as God shared his best with you, now you are challenged to go forth to share your blessings with others. May the peace and love of God go with you always. Amen. Let us now hum our traditional closing song, God be with you and on Wednesday. Have a happy St. Patrick's Day. God bless.